Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you've tuned in and are uh, just a part of our, our video here today. So probably all of us, at one time or another, we've heard someone begin a joke this way. A priest, a rabbi, and a minister walk into a, a store or an, a doctor's office. or You know, there's lots of variations of jokes about a rabbi and a priest and a minister. And I don't want to be too analytical, but why do we make a priest and a minister two different people? Maybe it's because in the Roman Catholic Church, there are priests. And in non-Catholic churches, there are ministers. But is that a false, artificial distinction? Well, I'll let you decide a little bit later. The title of today's question, uh, today's lesson is a question, how well do you know your priest? Now, you may be thinking, well, I don't know any priest all that well. And if that's what you're thinking, then you're probably thinking about a Catholic priest. But those of us who are born again, we do have a priest. His name is Jesus. And during this message, I hope that you'll come to know your high priest Jesus in a deeper and more intimate way. This morning, we are continuing our, our Hebrew study, one that we are calling Fix Your Eyes on Jesus. So let's jump right into our text. Now, a few weeks ago, as we were studying out of Hebrews chapter 2, I mentioned that we would talk more about Jesus as our high priest. Uh, so let's first read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, and then we're going to jump over into Hebrews chapter 4. So verse 17 of Hebrews 2 says, Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Now over in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, we read these words. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The idea of a high priest is sort of foreign to us, but it was a very important office to the old Jews. The writer of Hebrews is stressing how that Jesus is superior. He is superior to the prophets, he's superior to the angels, and he is superior to Moses. And now we see that Jesus is the greatest high priest. He is the superior high priest. Now, back in the Old Testament period, there were three different separate uh, national offices that were important. There was the prophet, there was the priest, and there was the king. And those three men were the most important VIPs of the nation. And Jesus fulfills all of these three positions in his life. He is the great prophet, as he calls us to share the work of proclaiming a message of, of salvation and mercy procured by his life and his death and his resurrection. Jesus is also our high priest. He brought us peace with God by offering himself up as the perfect substitutionary sacrifice for sin, and who is ever making intercession for us before the throne of God. But Jesus is also our reigning king. He is king of kings and lord of lords over all, both the spiritual 
and the physical. He calls us to share in his holy work of defending and serving others who bear the image of God. Now, of these three offices this morning, we're going to focus solely on Jesus' role as our high priest. First, let's take a few minutes to just fully appreciate the portrait of our high priest. Then we'll talk about the consequences of understanding Jesus as our high priest. You know, there are many wonderful portraits of Christ in Scripture. When you're in an art gallery, you shouldn't rush through and merely just glance at the art. You should stop and carefully appreciate all the details of the work. So join me this morning as we fix our eyes on Jesus to consider four important details in this portrait of our high priest. Here's the first detail. Detail number one, Jesus is a great high priest. We see in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14, we have a great high priest, Jesus the Son of God. Now, there were many Jewish high priests, but there is only one great high priest. The word great in the book of Hebrews is a form of the word mega. In this form, it's the word Megan. So if your name is Megan, you're a great person, and that's what your your name means. Our English word priest comes from the Greek word hieros, from which we get our English word hierarchy. In the Old Testament, there was a spiritual hierarchy between the priest and the people. Only the priest could approach the altar and the temple building. There were a series of walls that kept the Gentiles, the women, and even men away from the presence of God. Only the priest performed duties in the temple. The people brought their sacrifices and their offerings, but they were basically spectators. And there's a very strict hierarchy in the Catholic Church to this day. The Pope, the papacy, is called pontiff, which means bridge. Catholics consider the Pope as the bridge to God. There is only one Pope. And below him, there are about 200 cardinals, and below them are about 5,000 bishops, and below them are about 500,000 priests. And at the bottom of the hierarchy are the deacons and then the laity or the people. Now, lest you misunderstand what I'm saying, I don't want you to think that I'm bashing the Catholic Church. I believe that there are many born-again Catholics who are going to heaven. I even believe that there are some born-again Church of God folks who are going to heaven. But when you stand before God, you won't be asked if you were Church of God or Baptist or Catholic or Methodist. No, you'll be asked what you did with Jesus Christ. However, like the Protestant reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin and others, I believe that the Catholic Church created an artificial hierarchy that is never taught in Scripture. You go back to the early days of the church in the book of Acts. There was no hierarchy. All the believers shared everything in common. The apostles were a one-generation group of leaders that God gave to the church. But somewhere around the year 270 A.D., the church in Rome established a strict division between the clergy the professional priest, and all the people. Now, it's at this point in in church history that the Church of God Reformation movement teaches that the church, the New Testament church, went into apostasy. And the true New Testament church of God, signified by the woman clothed in the sun and standing on the moon, we read that in Revelation chapter 12, the woman fled into the wilderness for 1260 years. 
You know, today you can go into churches and there's a rail across the front that separates the holy place where only the priests can go and perform their religious duties. The ordinary masses are kept out in the viewing area except to approach the priest for his offering of a sacrament. By the way, if you take 270 A.D., and you add 1260 years, the precise period of time prophesied by Daniel in chapter 7 as the time when the little horn or the papacy would persecute the saints of the Most High and the specific amount of time that John the Revelator said that God would feed the woman in the wilderness in Revelation 12, that brings you to the year 1530 A.D., That would happen to coincide with the year of the Osberg Confession, where the Lutherans presented 21 biblical doctrines that had been abandoned by the Catholic Church, as well as exposing seven abuses practiced by the Catholic clergy. You know, for all intents and purposes, this would have been the start of the Protestant Reformation. Now, some Protestant churches still embrace that false hierarchy today. They make a distinct division between clergy and the laity. The New Testament teaches that we have one high priest and that we are all priests. That's called the doctrine of priesthood of believers. In nearly 25 years as a pastor, you've rarely heard me use the term layman or lay woman. That's because we're all equal at the foot of the cross. Now let me show you the correct hierarchy of the church. It's very simple. There's only two levels. Jesus Christ, our high priest, is the head of the church. And below him on one level are all the redeemed people. He is our great high priest. He is the head, and we are below him. That's the only hierarchy that's mentioned in the, in, in the whole Bible. By the way, that's why I really don't, be, don't enjoy being called reverend. First, no one should be revered except God. And second, that title is never applied to anyone in the Bible. And third, you can ask my wife, there are times when I'm not very reverent. Well, on second thought, maybe don't ask my wife. But in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus criticized the Pharisees because they loved to be addressed in public as rabbi or father. Now, I've had people call me everything from Father Stevens to the Right Reverend Stevens, and I wince every time I hear those terms. You know, when someone asks me what they can call me, my usual reply is Tracy, or if you prefer, you can call me Pastor Tracy, for which is like a nickname for what I do. You know, we only have one high priest and that is Jesus Christ. That brings me to the second detail that I want to mention this morning. Detail number two, he has gone through the heavens. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 says, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Now the Jewish temple in Jerusalem only contained two important rooms. And the rest of the area was open to the sky. There was the uh, most holy place where only priests could enter. And then there was a tall, thick curtain separating this room from the holiest place on earth. That inner sanctum was called the Holy of Holies. It was heaven on earth because it was there the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. Once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter and he would lift the the corner of the curtain and go through to the heavenly presence of Yahweh. 
Now, there was no place to sit in there, so the high priest had to stand and conduct his rituals of purification and then exit through the same curtain. But Jesus is superior because he went through the heavens into the eternal presence of the Father, and then we are told that he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, the word heaven is used three different ways in, in the Bible. It refers to the atmosphere around the earth or the sky. The Bible speaks of birds flying in the heavens. Second, the word heavens refers to the stellar sky, what we would call outer space. And thirdly, it refers to the dwelling place of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, Paul writes about a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven, and he called it paradise. Uh, You may have heard the phrase seventh heaven. Well, that's not in the Bible. In fact, the idea of seventh heaven comes from Islamic tradition, not the Bible. Jesus, our high priest, didn't have to simply go through a curtain. He stood on top of Mount Olives and ascended through the sky into the very presence of God. Now, we shouldn't think of the third heaven in terms of time and space. Uh, To use a term coined from the Star Trek universe, heaven is beyond the space-time continuum. And as we're going to find out a little later in this message, God's throne of grace is closer than you can imagine. And Jesus, our great high priest, has entered there, not for a few hours a year, but for our, as our high priest forever. That brings me to our third detail this morning. Detail number three, Jesus, our high priest, understands our weaknesses. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Now if you remember your sixth or your seventh grade English lessons, you know that this is called a double negative. Uh, I recall Mrs. Caldwell, my English teacher in junior high school, she used to say don't never use double negatives. But in the Greek language, this double negative is actually employed to intensify the meaning of the claim. So let's turn a negative into positive in English. We do have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. And that means Jesus really cares about how we feel and what it is that we're going through. Now, there were some wicked, uncaring high priests throughout the history of Israel. In 1 Samuel, we read about the high priest Eli. He accused Hannah of being drunk when she was prostrate in prayer, begging God for a child. He didn't control his two sons who had desecrated the temple. And God sent a messenger to Eli and said, you've blown it. And because you are such a bad priest, your sons are both going to die on the same day, and I'm going to take the priesthood away from you and give it to a pure priest. Years later, both of his sons died in battle, the same day that the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines. And when Eli heard the news, the Bible says that he fell over dead. The same day, his daughter-in-law gave birth to a son, and that son's name was Ichabod, which means the glory has departed. God said that he would raise up a pure priest. This was a messianic prophecy about Jesus because he was the only pure high priest, and he came to restore God's glory. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus was full of grace and glory. Now, here's the bottom line. Jesus cares for you. Jesus is God. 
And those are the two most important discoveries we are ever going to make. God exists, and he cares for me. Over in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said that sparrows are so common that two are sold for a penny, and yet God knows when just one of them falls to the ground. And then he said, the very hairs of your head are numbered, and you're worth more than many sparrows. Now, sparrows are the most common birds in the world, and yet the Creator notices when one falls. It doesn't say that he notices when they fly, but when they fall. That means when it struggles and perhaps dies. And the truth is, we are all creatures full of weakness, who often fall and fail. And Jesus, our high priest, really cares. He is not a high priest who points the finger of accusation and condemnation towards sinners. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, there's an old song that originated during the dark period of American slavery that says, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Have you ever felt that way? Then the song says, nobody knows but Jesus. Those are profound words that are still true. There is someone who knows and someone who cares, and his name is Jesus. That brings me to detail number four that I want to point out today. Jesus was tempted like us but never sinned. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You know, the reason Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses is because he put on human flesh, and he experienced every temptation that we face. Jesus has been tempted in every way as we have been. Now that word every means this, every single temptation. You will never face a temptation that Jesus hasn't faced and overcome. Uh, Jesus He was tempted to complain to God when John the Baptist was beheaded, but instead he honored John. Jesus was tempted to steal by not paying his taxes, but he resisted and paid up by sending Peter to find a coin in the mouth of a fish. He was tempted to lust when Mary wiped his feet with her hair, but instead he honored her as the only one who recognized that he was going to die. Jesus was tempted to lie in order to save his life, but he resisted and he claimed deity and was charged with blasphemy. Jesus was tempted to take revenge when he was wrongly accused, but he kept quiet and absorbed their insults. Every high priest who entered the Holy of Holies was a sinner. But Jesus is the only sinless man who ever walked on this planet. That's who our high priest is. He is the great high priest who has gone through the heavens, who sympathizes with our weaknesses, and faced every temptation we have. Isn't that an amazing portrait? So what are the consequences of having Jesus as our high priest. Well, let me give you three reasons to rejoice because Jesus is our high priest. Here's the first reason. Because Jesus is my high priest, I can persevere when I face trouble. You know, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 says again, seeing then that we have a great high priest, let us hold fast to our confession. Now, you got to remember that the, the letter to the Hebrews was written to Christians who were being tempted to reject Jesus and return to their Jewish religion. 
It was written before the Jewish temple was destroyed. So there was a high priest in Jerusalem who was still active. So the Hebrew writer is encouraging them not to go back to a system of priests and sacrifices. And the message to you and I today is that we shouldn't be satisfied with any religious system requiring us to go through any priest other than Jesus in order to relate to God. Our high priest gives us strength to persevere through trouble from without. You know, I've said before, those of us who hold on to a biblical view of morality are going to face ridicule and persecution in the days to come. As our culture moves farther and farther away from absolute truth, those of us who hold on to the truth of the Bible are going to be labeled as old-fashioned, intolerant, and worst of all, we're called haters. And yet I don't hate anyone or anything except the devil and sin. You know, here's the challenge that all of us face in the years to come. Will we hold on to our biblical faith or will we let go and grab hold of the, the popular shifting values of anything goes as long as I'm not hurting you morality? Are you willing to grip firmly, and to hold on to the truth of the faith that we profess. You know, we live in a culture that will try to rip that belief out of your hands and heart. So hang on to it firmly. A second reason for us to rejoice, because Jesus is my high priest, I can resist any temptation. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. It will help you overcome temptation if in the moment of temptation you understand that Jesus faced that same temptation and he resisted it. And he showed you and I how to resist temptation. You know, in the desert, he overcame the three basic categories of temptation mentioned in 1 John chapter 2, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. His flesh cried out for bread, but he resisted Satan's suggestion to turn stones into bread. The lust of the eyes is when we see riches that we covet, and Satan offered him all the riches of the world. Jesus resisted because he knew where the true source of riches come from. The pride of life seeks attention and celebrity. Jesus would have gained instant stardom if angels had caught him jumping off the pinnacle of the temple but he resisted. Jesus, he could have just snapped his holy fingers and Satan would have been vanquished. But instead, Jesus faced Satan as a man. And Jesus quoted three scriptures from the book of Deuteronomy to repel Satan's attack. When you are tempted to cry out to Jesus, Go to his word and use it as a sword of the spirit against the enemy. A third reason we can rejoice this morning is because Jesus is my high priest. I can approach God's throne with confidence. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now to the ancient world, the term throne of grace was an oxymoron. There were no thrones of grace. There were only thrones of royalty, which meant thrones of judgment, authority, and the power over life and death. It was a terrifying experience to approach a throne in ancient times. If the king didn't raise a scepter to accept you, you were killed right there on the spot. But I have good news for us this morning. God's throne 
is a throne of grace. According to Revelation chapter 20, there will be another throne, a great white throne, which will be used once as a throne of judgment. But at this moment, God's throne is a throne of grace. And I have some more good news. Because of Jesus, our high priest, you can approach God's throne with confidence. Now, there aren't very many places in this world where we can't enter. You know, this world is littered with warning signs such as restricted access or authorized personnel only. You see those signs at the hospital and at airports and at military installations. You know, if I wanted to get in to see President Biden or Queen Elizabeth or Pope Francis, I would be denied access. But that's okay because I have full and complete access to the throne of grace. And the good news just keeps on continuing. When we approach the throne of grace, we receive two amazing gifts. We receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Now, mercy and grace are different, but they are two sides of the same coin. Mercy is God withholding the punishment I deserve. Grace is God giving me the forgiveness I don't deserve. In other words, mercy is God saying, no punishment for you, even though you deserve it. Grace is God saying, forgiveness for you, even though you don't deserve it. There was a billionaire who was desperately seeking God, and he was visiting the Oval Office, and he saw a golden phone, and he asked, well, what's that? And President Biden said, oh, so that's a phone line to God, but I seldom use it because it's a billion dollars a minute long distance charge. So still searching, the billionaire later happened to be visiting the Kentucky Capitol in in Frankfurt. And he's in the governor's office, and he saw a golden phone on the wall, and he said, well, what's that? And Governor Bashir said, oh, so that's a phone line to God in heaven. And the billionaire said, well, how much does it cost for that long-distance call? Governor Bashir said, oh, it's free, because here in Kentucky, heaven's a local call. Now, before you swoon from your Kentucky pride, I got to tell you that the throne of grace is a local call from anywhere on earth. Even though Jesus went through the heavens to arrive at God's throne, you and I don't have to travel millions of light years in order to get there. The throne of heaven is closer than you might think. The throne of grace is not in remote space. It is right in the heart of every believer in whom Jesus dwells. To come to the throne of grace does not mean address an appeal across the reaches of space to some distant point in heaven. It means to reckon upon the one who indwells us. The throne of grace is that close to us, that available to us. Now, this promise should energize our prayer lives. We can approach and ask with confidence because Jesus, our high priest, has promised that we could ask the Father anything in his name and he would grant it. It is only because of Jesus, our high priest, that we're able to approach God's throne of grace. When we approach God the Father, We have a high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who says, Father, I told him or her that they could ask anything in my name, and you'd give it to them. And the father says, well, on the basis of what my son said, I'm happy to grant your request. You know, we often say it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that's certainly spiritually true. When you know Jesus intimately, you will hold on to your faith with perseverance. You'll face and overcome temptation, and you'll approach the throne of grace with great confidence and assurance. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Lord, we are so thankful that Jesus is our great high priest. We are thankful that he is a high priest who sympathizes with us. He is a high priest who has been tempted as we have been tempted. He is a high priest who cares for us. But he is also a high priest that gives us access to the very throne room of heaven. Father, I pray today that every believer listening to the sound of my voice, Lord, that we would go through our high priest and that we could touch the throne room of heaven. Father, today I pray for your power. I pray for your strength. We pray, Lord, that everything would be granted because we ask in the name of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Next Sunday, we'll be continuing our series on the book of Hebrews. We hope that you'll join us. Don't forget to join us on Wednesdays for our live online Bible study on the Gospel of Luke. That's Wednesday mornings at 1030 a.m. You can join us live on Facebook Wednesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. If you miss any of the Bible studies or sermons, you can check them out on Facebook, or you can also go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Thanks again for joining in today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.